Got it. Hey, yep. got it. Oh, ho, ho. It's number 96. Once again, going to kick around a lot of space stuff on the screen, ladies and gentlemen, from new theories, discoveries, space probes to planets, the cosmos, constellations and galaxies and stars like our solar system. Yep, it's the 96th episode. Welcome aboard. 96 in a row for the SBAU Astro Hour, where our South Coast longtime astrophysics and telescope club we call the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, SBAU, distance from the Earth to the Sun. Every Monday morning, 11 to noon, SBAU's Brain Trust meets online through Zoom. Talk about our favorite subject, all viewable on YouTube. Number 97, next week, we're at 96 now and approaching a two-year mark, gang. This uh, week, we're going to talk Monday mornings here uh, about star clusters Again, star clusters are us. Two Messier galaxies, at least. Close, but no cigar. <laughs> Mars is going away again. Rotating pole stars. What's that all about? And a really big meteorite found in China. Where is it today? Is it part of Chuck's collection? We'll find out. He might even be able to show it to us. Let's meet the, uh, the gang here, the Brain Trust. Mr. President, beloved Jerry Wilson, greetings. Seasons greetings for you. Married to lovely Pat Corgi, survived another Christmas and another election. He's five years going on six, I think. Chuck McPartland in front of the Ukrainian flag is our incredible outreach coordinator, whose wife, Pat, also married to a Pat, is our merchandise manager. And there's Tom Whittemore baking bread on his day off. He's got nothing but days off these days. Former Westmont College science instructor and editor of our SBAU newsletter might want to tip your camera down a little so we can get your chin in uh, Tom. <laughs> but uh, it's always good to have you guys on board i don't know where spam collector is that's his uh, email address uh, bruce murdoch um incidentally uh tom is married to maureen i'm gonna give everybody their their just dues and we get silly science cartoons emailed to us forwarded by the president because <laughs> we like to start these things lightly and Gently, and here we go. Oh, this one. Um, what, let's see. What was my the pizza pie of knowledge? Really this small. One, this one occurred uh, it was on the astronomy cartoons website, but um, it's not really a cartoon. It's probably pretty accurate. In my view. <laughs> pretty sobering, really. We know that little. Mm -hmm. That's what Neil deGrasse Tyson would say. We got a lot to to learn, don't we? <laughs> Amazing stuff. Wow. There's, there's an old phrase, a phrase from uh, a scientist at one time, I forget his name, Tom we know, but he said the universe is stranger than we know, and it may be stranger than we can know. Okay, so they don't give us numbers, but you can see that's only about two degrees. Remember who that was, Tom? Uh, could be Michio Kaku. Does that sound he right? He said it on TV, but I don't think he was the originator of it, but he might have okay. been. Okay. okay. That's that's not far off from what the universe is made of. The stuff we know or we can see is only, what, about a sixth? And then there's a big chunk. Less, of less than that. It's like 4%, right? 4 or 5%. Of visible matter? Of, of matter we know anything about, whether it's visible or not. Yeah, baryonic matter. Yeah. A big, a big part of that pie chart would be uh, dark matter, which we can't see. And then the rest is, what, dark energy? Yeah. Like the big part is dark energy. All right. Well, we'll get that one next week. Let's go to the silly stuff, Mr. President, and I'll see if I can match. Ah, here are the two. <laughs> the mountain goat. Good Lord. Far side. Uh, not terribly yeah. scientific, but definitely foreboding as the two pilots in the airliner have a fateful encounter high up. Clouds part. They're caught in a big cumulus. And good luck, gentlemen. Sayonara. Here's Santa Claus back onto the roof with his reusable sleigh. <laughs> uh, going backwards like, if it's good enough for Elon and SpaceX, then it's good enough for the reindeers. There used to be a house along Foothill. When you're driving along Foothill, sometimes you can look down on the roofs of the houses. And for Christmas, he had put a big lighted arrow pointing toward his chimney. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, here is the Xmas tree uh, ornament. We determined X is the old way of saying Christmas. The round ball on the left being orbited by the small, uh, that's the Apollo capsule, right? That's this, not this is a political, this is a from December 68. Um, 
six months before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Mm-hmm. So this is looking for um, a note on my computer that says your connection is unstable. Sometimes I disappear. I will come back on if I disappear as soon as I can. So carry on. I think that was <laughs> Apollo 8 that did the first, you know, Earthrise picture. Oh, yeah. Um, before they landed. Yeah. Yeah. How, how many successful moon landings from 11 through what, 17? That would have yeah, been 17. So there were six. There were but, five. But 13 didn't make it. Yeah, so 13 right. was the uh, Tom Hanks version. Wow, that's good stuff. Six, yeah. Yeah, all right. Let's go to another one. Get some silly levity here at the season, our Christmas edition. You can watch on YouTube. My name's Ron Heron, incidentally. I'm vice president again. Quantum <laughs> superposition doggo. The dog is. Sitting, take a look at the rear end, the standing. He's got his front legs on the ground and laying his <laughs> leg, no, his uh, front, his head, chin on the, at the same time. Yep. Three different states of being. Yeah, he's, al- <laughs> he's also pooping, but a lot of people can't tell that. So no, that's tail. Okay. <laughs> ah, here we go. Uh, this is something I've always wondered about. Why we see news anchors <laughs> only from the waist up. Here comes Walter Cronkite out of an alien saucer. Uh, the bottom half of his body, slithery, slimy tentacles, all the other slithery, slimy newsmen <laughs> and women equipped with uh, octopus legs. And uh, Walter says, good afternoon, half earthlings. So far, so good. We now control the prime source of their information. The foolish earthlings do not suspect a thing. Ha, ha, ha. Now return to your stations. And that's the way it is. <laughs> Good imitation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's bad. All right. Okay. That's, uh, you guess who they've uh, run into here? A UFO meets Santa Claus. A couple extraterrestrials <laughs> in their spacecraft encounter Santa's sleigh plus the eight flying reindeer. One says to the other, I don't know about you. For the record, I did not see a thing. Okay. That's kind of <laughs> and, a, yeah, on the clear sky chart uh, for the last couple of days, probably not now. When when you looked at the clear sky chart on for Christmas Christmas morning, it showed a silhouette of Santa Claus and the reindeer. Oh, well, boy, the military sure has fun telling the big news outlets about tracking the incoming sleigh above NORAD and Northern Canada. What have we got here? Drivers ignore this year's Darwin Award. This year's Darwin Award may come directly from the uh, atmosphere bomb or what do yeah. they call it? Tornado bomb. bomb yeah. tornado. Drivers ignoring winter conditions may be subject to natural selection. <laughs> oh, then we're back to the beginning. Oh. Survival of the fittest. All right, here we go. Lots to talk about. Um, now, my good friend, Mike Hardwick, who is in the club, just bought his fifth or sixth telescope, and I'm not sure if he's watching this on YouTube, but he said with his newly bought Celestron, he uh, showed me a cluster shaped like a Christmas tree. Yeah. And I said, where in the world is that? I emailed him that. And then guess what the opening lines were to the talking points this week from <laughs> President yep. Jerry? The Christmas tree star cluster. It's an asterism, I assume, right? Or yep. this, 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 this. Now, this is, a, this is a long exposure of it and so so it's distorted from what it would look like in your telescope visually. But if you look, we show this at um, some of our outreaches and it's usually upside down in my telescope and no one can figure it out. And I say, it, and it's upside down and then everybody goes, oh yeah, there I see it. So, but the, the Christmas tree is the shape of these stars here and up there. And this is the support structure, whatever it is, the pot. It's yeah. yeah, so that's the cluster. It's also surrounded by uh, nebula, and this nebula up here is the cone nebula. I think it's NGC 2244 or 2246. I forget which is. Anyway, it's, a very, it's a very striking feature to look at in your amateur telescope. It's sometimes of- called the Madonna and Child. Oh, you're kidding. Really? Mm. It's the cone kind of- nebula. In yep. the northeast right. sky, Monoceros is the unicorn. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. The, the one horn. One horn. Literally. And it's next to Orion. 
it's a winter constellation. Like the uh, purple people eater at one horn. Uh, yeah, yeah an another there. Christmas tree cluster I show at Westmont is M103. It's up in the range of Cassiopeia. It does look like a tree. I showed it uh, Friday, uh, two Fridays ago. Well, the only thing that would make it better is if Webb could zero in on some uh, red giant stars and some super blue and <laughs> all connected around. It's too, bad. it's too bad there are no green stars in the sky. Yeah. But uh, yeah. actually, there is an illusion of a green star, I think. In Hercules? I, I'm, the There's the I don't know. There might be more than one. But I, I think Antares. No. Antares... Yeah. Does, does it have a small companion? Yes, I've yeah. seen it. Yeah. yeah. By contrast, then, with bright orangery um, Antares, the, visually, this companion looks green, but yeah. it's an optical illusion. But yeah, we saw it at uh, the, the observatory I helped design at, uh, in San Jose, uh, Evergreen Valley College. We hmm. saw it in a seven inch F9. That sounds oh, like an astrophysics. Telescope. It was. Yeah. <laughs> it's a doublet. Yeah. Oh, astrophysics. Mead made those too. Okay. Seven this inch an, F9 an and F six inch F9. Yeah. One, one of the members of my old club, the SJAA, uh, New Schaefer, Rich New Schaefer, loaned us that, uh, that telescope so that we could um, use a telescope that was a lot like the uh, Tom Back scope we ended up putting in there. Okay. Uh -huh. Basically, a duplicate of the Tom Back. Yeah. Well, you're talking. Tom Back scope, I think, was a triplet. Um, the. Uh, I, I think you're right. Chuck, does that sound right? Yeah. Chuck nine was a doublet. Yeah. But both of but my Tom Backs are triplets. They're triplets, but, but yeah. they're, they're not that big. <laughs> okay. So, Jerry, did you give us the name of a star that was in it? One of the stars that make up. Well, no, I don't know. I don't recall the name that's in it, but I do there in the uh, crossing points. Uh, magnitude 3A, 3A, uh, no, just Alzir, which is Z Geminorum. Genum oh, that's just on the way to finding it. Okay. Yeah, well, that's nearby. Yeah, right. It's three degrees <laughs> south southwest, and the cluster itself is magnitude 3.1. 3.1, that means we can see it with the naked eye? That's the cumulative, <coughs> cumulative brightness. All the stars together. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's definitely an asterism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of be more asterisms up there than constellations, aren't there? Yep. Yep. In, any 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 pattern you see is a new asterism. <laughs> right. <laughs> you suppose you suppose I saw you... one Saturday night, a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> triangle Venus, Mercury and in the moon. <laughs> Well, do you suppose you can throw them all up on the ceiling of our planetarium? Does Chrissy Cook have all the asterisms? I know we got all 88 well, constellations. There's there's no real such thing as all asterisms, Ron. An well, asterism is just a pattern of stars. So what we, well, it depends on what you see in it. And and there are there aren't a lot of official ones. Yeah. And there's a lot of them. But yeah. we cover them mm -hmm. on this program. But this is an NGC, so it, it could be put up on the on the screen. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I didn't believe him when he showed it to me. I said, no, you, I've never heard of that before, but I do now. You want to go to a nebula, the big black cloud that turns out to be a nursery? It's called B68, Bernard's Nebula. Mm -hmm. Or we got more to do with the Christmas. It's a star field. Edward, Edward, whatever his name is, Bernard, Barnard, was uh -huh. an astronomer who worked around the 1900s. Yeah. 900. And um, he was fascinated with nebulas that were dark. Yeah. They were uh, not illuminated. They didn't produce their own light. And they weren't close enough to a bright star to be, have starlight reflected off of them. They tended to be mirror objects that were in front of massive star clouds in the Milky Way. And this is one of them, the most the darkest and smallest that fits in a single frame. And you can see that there's absolutely no stars in front of it. It looks just like a hole. <laughs> looks like a fat uh, the, uh, stock. What's that? Looks looks like a fat Christmas stocking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. E. E. Barnard was at the Lick Observatory for a lot of his career in the San Jose. Yeah. 
So, so all the stars around it are just as thick where it is, except we can't see them. So we're looking at something mm -hmm. solid there. That's not a hole. It's actually gas, and dust. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's an obscuring cloud. But the cloud is dense. Starlight does not come through it. You don't see stars in the nebula, so there's nothing in front of it, nothing yeah. bright enough behind it to shine through. So these... These are actually places where the stars, the dust is starting to gravitationally collapse and form into a star making region. Eventually, this will be like the uh, core of the Orion Nebula. It will have uh, rock globules in it, that, that then, which are concretions, that yeah. collapse until the temperature rises high enough to start fusion and then it becomes a star. And then when it's a star, it will it, it's um, solar wind or stellar wind will blow the remaining dust away, and then you'll see a star cluster. But when we look at something like the pillars of creation, we can see the stars in, inside them. Uh, how come we don't see any in the black of this? They're not forming yet. Right. Really? But yeah, uh, another very famous E. Barnard object is B33, the horse head. Okay. And that, oh, that's, yeah. Uh, that's in Orion. Wait till you see that next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll cover that next week for you folks watching. So we're watching solar systems, stellar systems create, and yet they take that slow a time. They're not, they're not actually, this is in the very, very earliest stage of star yes. formation. Mm -hmm. It is just starting to collapse gravitationally. That's why it's so dense. The pillars of creation are not as dense. You can see through them a little bit. Some of them are dense enough you can't see through, but then there's starlight shining on them, you can see them. And due to some physics principle, they all that stuff that comes together always turns around and starts spinning. It just never clumps together and becomes one big ball. Right. Yeah, there was a, an astronomer, Ron, named Jeans, J-E-A-N-S, English guy, who basically set up models for how this stuff actually happens. Is it is it similar to the process that causes hurricanes? That sort of it's conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum, yeah. And, and virtually all stars, that's how they get planets orbiting them. They start out swirling, like an eddy or a whirlpool. There's little eddies swirling or swirling around them, and sometimes they fall into the star. As you'll see later when we talk about an extraordinary meteorite. Um, the early solar system here, our solar system, was basically a shooting gallery of uh, planetary size objects. But we'll get to that. Oh, okay. But this is, who was Barnard? Anybody know? E. E. Barnard. Yeah. He also did photography, was one of the earliest photographic astronomers. And he made a um, very nice limited edition book of all the dark nebula that he did. And it was, they were meticulous graphs and the photographs were actually pasted into the book. So they weren't like printed because you lose so much um, quality. It was supposed to be very beautiful and there's a reprint of it you can buy now, but the, the pictures are actually, what is it, half-tone printed. They're not uh, uh, yeah. in it anymore. <clears throat> I think there were like 20 copies or 50 copies or something of the first book, and it's extremely. When he was at when he was at Lick Observatory up on Mount Hamilton near San Jose, he primarily, as far as I know, used that refractor, that 36 inch, for a lot of his astrophotography. He was really good. Really, was, good. I, I may be recalling wrong, but isn't he? He's like the guy from Tennessee that was self-taught too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there were a number of people like that. Yeah. 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 So what we're looking at right now is a future star cluster. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. A future stellar nursery and after that star cluster. That'll orbit around themselves? Or did we establish Maybe not? That would be very dense. That would be a globular cluster. Not really clear how globular clusters um, form, at least to me. And um, so this would most likely be an open cluster. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've heard that there are black holes everywhere, so there's probably one in the center of many clusters, and I'm sure there's not one in this maybe yet, but black holes usually are the center of certainly our galaxies, right? It, yeah. yeah, often. Mm -hmm. yeah, we a couple, have of, couple of globular clusters have them. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bar There's a lot of them floating free that are not part of anything. They're just mm -hmm. in our galaxy like a star, but they're very difficult to see. Well, just like watching for a supernova to flame up, is it possible we'll see a star suddenly come to life in this sucker? Well, this Light one up. is really early in the stages here. Yeah. yeah. Well, how long does it take? Uh, Hundreds um, of millions of years at least. Yeah. 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 Maybe a billion years. It's the word suddenly is is um, on a geologic scale there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ron, at, at Westmont a couple of Fridays ago, I was showing folks uh, a lot of open clusters. That's kind of my favorite thing. And a number of the stars in these clusters were young, but they were still 100 million years old. <laughs> They're still young, you know. Well, uh, tell me something about uh, the generations involved. We're part of a third generation star, right? That's how we get all the past elements that were created in former <laughs> explosions. Yes, and ironically, we're called Population One stars. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Bada. <laughs> uh, uh, population One star, is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. What does that mean, Population One? That means it's Generation Three. Oh, okay. In other words, uh, if we were one of the, if the beginning, yeah, what I'm asking is this black hole here of, of matter, has it been dust? And, for the whole 13.9 billion years? No. Or has it, been other, it, has it been stars before, do you suppose? Yes. That's right. This, yeah. this, is, this is made out of supernova remnants and planetary yes. remnants and mm -hmm. planetary nebula remnants. So. Yeah. Yeah, and Ron, what we're looking at is not a black hole. Yeah. <laughs> I, I lot, understand that. There's a lot of dust and gas, you know, that's occluding a lot of the uh, background stars. Right. I'm going to call it a black sock. Okay, and around the around the edge, uh -huh. around the edge here, you can see that the stars are more tan color because they're they're in less dense regions of the nebula, but shining mm -hmm. through. And it's in here, the core is really dark. So, th so there's a gradient of gas around this. The really yes. thick part is black, but the lesser parts that are out there that the stars are shining through uh, scatter the blue wavelengths of light. And so they look that kind of reddish color. Yeah. That's well, quite an, boy, that's a beautiful image. Wow, I've never seen the sky that full of stars around it. It's amazing. That's all in our galaxy. It's all in the Milky Way, right? Yeah, yeah so it's all in the Milky Way because the, that, that, that's where the big star clouds are that they get in the way of. There may be other ones around that um, are dark nebulous too, but we don't see them so easily. Mm -hmm. mm. The, in, the most impressive amateur and professional astrophotos that I've seen is where they can actually bring out um, surface features of these darker nebulas and turn them into clouds of, um, see the shading and gradation in them. More 3D. Yeah. Yeah, that takes uh, a real talent in uh, astro imaging. Okay, let's move on. What's next? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Christmas tree to the nebula. Is this the comet? This mm -hmm. is a comet. We talked about it last month. Um, a while ago, we were down here at December 12. Now we're up here at December 26. We just passed closest approach to Polaris. Mm -hmm. um, there's the star cluster NGC 188 up here. Yeah, it's and, open. Uh, what's that? Oh, it's just an open cluster, and it turns out I think it's Caldwell 1. And okay. it's the furthest north, Jerry, of any open cluster in the night sky, if, if I remember right. So, so this is the closest to this of any open cluster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What is, the, what is the shortest way to refer to this? Because the official name is C slash 2020 V2 ZTF. I know that kind of rolls off the tongue for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've heard it referred to as just ZTF. No other comet is given ZTF in parentheses. No, there's no, there's lots of ZTF comets. Yeah. And there's yes. another one that's a lot brighter than this one that is uh, in Corona Borealis right now. And on Christmas Eve morning, I got a picture of it. And as a matter of fact, uh, Chuck's going to show that picture right now. 
Yeah, let's do let's do a share on that. Oh, neat. So you were up early in the morning, dude. Well, yeah, this I, was oops. at four forty-seven. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's one of your pictures. The the bright spot in the, the now in the middle. Yeah, that's not much. Now of a tail. this doesn't show. This is showing the dust tail a little bit. You can see that fan-shaped dust tail going out to the top of the screen. Uh huh. But it has a long, spiky ion tail that goes okay. off to the left and up kind of along that line of stars there that you're not seeing here because this is only a 30 second exposure. But this is magnitude, I think it's gone to magnitude seven now, but it was at magnitude eight. It's like six times brighter than they predicted it was gonna be. So this one may get naked eye at the end of January and early February Neat. from a dark place. If, if you could get a longer exposure, we'd see it, right? But you can't do a longer exposure because the damn thing's moving slowly. Yeah. I could have done a longer exposure. I don't have a way to track on the comet, so it would have been mm -hmm. smeared. But a longer exposure, um, I get light glow from Santa Barbara and actually from the coming dawn that would have wiped it out. Well, I'm getting... How, how, long, how long did you say the exposure was? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay, thanks. What, what if you just clicked once? What would we see, anything? Nothing. I mean, that's all I did was click once, but it was a 30 second exposure. <laughs> so this, this is a single frame photograph then? Yeah. Yes. You've well, got one, one little bad red pixel in the lower right there. Yeah, I, I didn't that's do, an uh, I didn't that's do an a dark frame. That's an excellent photograph or, or yeah. camera you have to only have one red dot somewhere <laughs> it's got a couple uh but it i didn't like i didn't bother with all the dark frames and stuff i did take multiple short exposures uh and i figure i could try you know superimposing them but uh the comet would have moved and been smeared so i thought okay yeah. never mind yeah was that through your uh ap your yeah five -inch? It's a it's a Nikon uh, D5100 uh, ISO 6400 30 seconds looking through the AP. Uh, okay. To find focus. Mm -hmm. It looks like a thousand bats flying out of a cave at sunset. Uh, <laughs> so this is the drive by itself. You're not actively guiding it. I, I'm correct? not guiding. No. Yeah. Okay. That's absolutely outstanding. The stuff. Yeah. Stars are very round. Very nice picture. That's that's an AP mount for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's not going to go around the sun, at least not close up. It is orbiting the sun, right? Yeah. In the plane. Yeah, it, it's going to, I think it's coming down from the northern. Oh, at an angle? Up toward the northern sky now. Yeah, it's not in our ecliptic. Yeah. Is, yeah. is Polaris in this picture? No. No. no this one is not here. This He's is in a different. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, Chuck said, I think he was in the Corona Borealis. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, but it's heading up to be circumpolar later. Yeah, okay. this is not the same comet we looked at with, with finder chart. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is a different one, but it's also a ZTF. This one is E3 ZTF, C2022 E3 ZTF. Okay. And that ZTF means Zwicky Transient Facility or something like that. It's, a, it's an automated scope down at Palomar that looks for transient objects, things that are moving or things that are changing brightness. What does V2 mean? Well, that's the that's the uh, the time of the year it was found. The letter V, like Valentine. Yeah, that's the time of the year it was found. Like this one is E3. So it's like each letter is half a month, something like that. Or, or you know, so A and B are in January, C, D are in February, E, F are in March. So this one was E3. It was found in March of 2022. And it was the third comet found in, in that part of March. I see. But overnight it got up north, right overhead near the North Star, right? Not this one, no. That's oh, the other one. That's V2. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was the one. I'm, I'm no. And this one, this one will be heading up and be circumpolar later in the year. Oh, okay. You suppose the ancients would have been able to see this? Well, if this one gets naked eye brightness, yes, they would have been able to. But not at this brightness here. Yeah. This is 8.5. You can only see the six. Yeah. 
chances are they could only see the, uh, the the comets that get in close to the sun. Then they really brighten up, don't they? Yeah, or really active ones. They don't have to be close. And they have two tails, one that tracks where they've been and the other goes out from the sun. Is that out my understanding? Well, they both kind of go out from the sun, but the dust tail curves and is more gravitationally affected. And the mm -hmm. ion tail is just the wind, the solar wind carries it off. At any one time, there's at least a comet or two in the sky. In the no, there's dozens. Dozens? <laughs> Jeez. Man, it just okay. depends how big your scope is. What what have you gone to here, Jerry? What is this a picture of? And I'll catch up. Oh, this is um, this is a wider field of the finder for that comet. This is where it was on December twelfth. Yeah. Um, but I was I was went to this to see if we could find um, Coma Bernices on it. Uh huh. Or Corona Borealis. Corona Borealis. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. No, that's by Arcturus, so that's yeah. quite a ways away. Right. Yeah, this is out of the field of view. Okay. That's the ice cream. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then where are we now? That's not a comet. That's, those are galaxies, aren't they? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a pair of very popular um, galaxies for, for, for outreach, M81 and M82. And there's a couple of other galaxies in there, too that are much farther away that don't have a Messier number. Um, but this is also called Bode's Galaxy. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the Cigar Galaxy. So they're very interesting. They're, they're close enough to us that we can actually resolve stars in them with um, Hubble and uh, Earth-based telescopes. This is a close-up of the spiral galaxy M82. And uh, this is Bode's galaxy. It's a very nicely formed spiral. What did we say about that? M81 is an oval. M82 is long and thin, and they're half a degree apart in the sky. Yeah, you can you can get them in the um, this view right here will fit in the single eyepiece of a low power eyepiece that most of our telescopes. Let's go. Um, and from here in the city or in Goleta, uh, they are on a dark night. You can just pick them out as faint fuzzies. You don't see this structure. At least I don't see it. Yeah, M81 oh. is, is actually Bode's, and M82 is a cigar. You can see structure okay. in the cigar in, in, in our scopes, but A81 is a little harder to see. Yeah. So do you suppose these two this are, is, um, are they comparable to us in Andromeda? In other words, I think they're regarded as a little bit smaller, but not much. Smaller, yeah. Closer together than we are to Andromeda. And yes. Yeah. They're only hundreds of thousands this of light years apart from each other. And that's what's happening to this galaxy you see. It's uh -huh. called a starburst galaxy or a, a, a radio loud galaxy because it's getting tidally disrupted by M81, and uh, it's causing all kinds of bursts of new star formation, which means lots of supernovas. And you can see where they're blowing all this hydrogen out from the core region. Now, this isn't the cigar, is it? This is the yeah, cigar. This yeah. is the yeah. cigar. You can all see that at one end, you see flares up, and at here at the other end, it goes down. That's the tilt to or a distortion that's common to galaxies that are gravitationally interacted or have had a recent uh, close counter. Our galaxy does the same thing. It ha has, it's tipped up at, at one extreme and down at the other. And Andromeda is the same way. It's Potato got a chip. Core, what's that? Potato chip. Yeah. <laughs> so these are the, this is the Pringle cluster. Yeah. yeah. And it warps the edge of the Frisbee then, right? That's. Wow, and, and that stuff across the middle of it, that, is that in the foreground? Is that dust and gas that's almost obliterating the center? Yeah. Is that part of it? That's part of it, inside of it. Mm -hmm. We would look the same. We have, you know, those dark baclobules or the dark nebulae and stuff are distributed like that in our galaxy along the plane of the galaxy. And then the bright stars around it, those brighter dots, they're in our galaxy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
the Although corporate. there was a bright supernova in this galaxy in 2012. Yeah. So we imaged that at what on. Yeah. Now there are a number of other galaxies in this picture. One yeah. there, one there, and the spiral galaxy there. Wow. A pair of them down here. So when you get through a really big telescope like this, you start picking up a zillion other galaxies. Yeah. 12, 12 million light years out, something like that. Right around that, yeah. Do you suppose M81 and M82 are headed toward each other? Yes, mm -hmm. they are. They've interacted in the past, and so they're, they may be heading away now from a close encounter, but they're gravitationally bound. And that's what caused the uptick in the edges, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah it takes a while as these things, that are they move quickly, but they are very big. And while one end is being tidally distorted by another galaxy, the other end isn't being for a while. And so it, you get different, as it passes by, you get different strengths of interacting gravity at different parts of the disk. That's what gives these warping and, and distortions to. Some of them get very dramatic, like the uh, NGC 7331. You know, it looks like most of the spiral arms have been wrapped out one side. I don't believe you included in your notes, Jerry, the distance. How many hundreds of millions or it's it's 12 million light years. It's in the notes. It says 11.7, I think. Yeah, 11.6, yeah, to the yeah, to the pair. I just didn't uh, write it down for some reason. And they came close uh, about 300 million years ago. To us? They came close. Close, to us. yeah. Wow. What's it doing way out there? <laughs> yeah. No, 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 not, not to us, Ron. Close to each other. Oh, yeah. oh I see. Oh, okay, got yeah. it. And they each have a they each have a, a supermassive black hole at the center of them. <clears throat> so it's doing one of those dances that the computer generated comes yes. through. Yeah. And depending on their relative velocities, they might just pass by and destroy each other for the moment, or they might come back for a rematch. So <laughs> We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Okay. Dramatic objects, good things. This one is a nice one because it's got a nice tracking star right here if you track for long images. Now, Messier. Okay, okay what do we got here? This are we on Mars again? An homage to Mars. Mars was um, at oh. uncle, um at, what is it? Closest approach opposition. Right. Uh, now I'm yeah, moving. Come on. A couple months ago, and it's shrunk from 17 seconds diameter, apparent diameter, to 15 seconds apparent diameter. So it's shrinking down in the last few weeks. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But the um, I like these images because they are these are from a French amateur, Robert Casilla Casillac in France, and so that's why everything in French, of course. That's uh, excellent images as a friend of mine on Facebook. And uh, he shows the, uh, the main terrestrial or Mars, Mars, Martian features. He shows the, the feature and he also shows the, the dark patterns, the visual patterns that are easy to see in amateur scopes. And here's the disk at the resolution that we would see if we looked at in our amateur scopes or imaged it and processed the image. Here he shows a processed image, not from his amateur equipment, but it shows the actual features on the surface. And what we see are these brown veins and um, geological differences in composition. But when you see all the close-ups of Mars and our rovers chug around on Mars, you don't notice these big features here that are just um, albedo differences. Al al yeah, albedo. It's a big field, a, a big uh, mare, or a, what would you call that dark spot? That Rocky dark spot, uh, Sinus Sibaeus, Sinus Sibaeus. Yeah, it's dark it's feature. A bay. It means a bay. Yeah. yeah, it's like a mare on a moon. And the, the French over there uh, translates to high country. Yeah, the, the mare it, on the moon are actually lava lakes that are frozen over that's not what it is on mars 
It's some kind of uh, composition, I'm guessing, different. He's using a C14, a Celestron, 14 inch Celestron edge uh, with a camera called Uranus C. Uh, do we have a rover on this plot? No. We don't. We do not have a rover in Schiaparelli, this, this major crater. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, what's the status of the rover? How's Perseverance and Ingenuity doing? The little helicopter from the hell. Doing fine. Uh, yeah. I haven't in seen Morris Braun, it's known as a red rover. The red <laughs> rover. <laughs> God, I forgot that game. <laughs> That's great. Anyway, this, this shows another uh, major feature, <clears throat> Solus Lacus. Um, you can see easily with your um, at one phase of Mars, not phase, but rotation of Mars. Here it is over here. Got this large curved light area around it. Now, these things are visible. They're actual features, Albedo features. This shows a map of that region. See, there's the big white arc. There's the same white arc. This is filled in with what people thought of from Percival Lowell in 1895, who built the 24 inch telescope in Flagstaff, Arizona. These were the canals that he thought he was seeing. What he was seeing was actually the head, was actually seeing structures in his own eye. But didn't understand it. They look like straight lines in a telescope somehow, right? No, they look like straight lines to him in a telescope. <laughs> yeah. He was and seeing people. He was, he was seeing done. structure of, of the blood vessels in his retina, basically. Yes, that's right. Man was high on drugs when he's. <laughs> it's interesting. He was the son of. A, he he was. Um, what is that called? A something baby where they inherit their money, inheritance baby or something. Uh, um, trust fund child. Of, what's that? Trust fund child. That's it. <laughs> and he took the money. He liked He liked nightlife. He wanted to be in big cities with bars and nightclubs. But he also want, loved astronomy. And he wanted to be, he was one of the first people to build a telescope roughly out where the scene was good, not where, because up until that time they built these things in or near big cities like Paris. And the scene was marginal, it was only secondary. But he put his in Flagstaff because it was the best compromise, he thought, between nightlife and astronomy. So apparently there was a bar there he liked. <laughs> uh, how long was he before H.G. Wells wrote a book? They were probably contemporary. Contemporaries, Ron, yeah. Oh, they were contemporaries. So mm -hmm. yeah, late, late 1800s. See, this was this drawing was made by Percival Lowell in 1895. Down there. So HG climbed right on board, and I uh, wonder if he knew Jules Verne. He obviously would have read him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, early science fiction. I guess we didn't have science fiction before the 19th century, did we? Edgar uh, Allan Poe wrote science fiction. Oh. Well, I know Edgar Allan Poe invented the detective story. Uh, I thought that the original science fiction story was credited to um, the author, the lady that Frank did Frankenstein. Oh, so Shelley? Shelley, Shelley yeah. yeah. Shelley's wife, yeah. Percy Shelley's wife. Pretty clear. Science I think fiction. that was the earliest one. We wouldn't put drag people. So if I'm wrong, phone in your answers. Yes. <laughs> is Tim Tim Crawford on board watching us on YouTube? No, I haven't seen any texts from Tim. All okay. Right. He's away from the holidays. A lot of people are. Great stuff. Mars. I don't know why they, we don't say that we've, we're passing Mars. Why don't they say that? We're on the inside track and going faster. Yeah. So, so, Ron, night after night after night, I've been watching Mars climb higher and higher and higher in the eastern sky. So it's kind of leaving Aldebaran behind as it crawls up, 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 up. Okay, you're saying it's climbing in the sky, but it's still flat on the uh, sun's ecliptic. So I guess oh, we're- Yeah, but the night sky is, is to go higher, higher, higher each night. Because you know, when we had that opposition a couple of Wednesdays ago, um, Mars and Aldebaran seem to be about on the same line level. 
over the east. But huh. now Mars is definitely up. You know, I just I, I'm trying to decide where when we get the retrograde. When do we see it turn around? That's on the other side of the sun, isn't it? No, no, uh -uh. that's when we pass it. When we catch, you know, like on a highway. You know how you pass a car and it looks like the car is going backwards. The same same phenomenon. Oh, okay. I can dig. I if, if, I, if I might give our listeners just a little spot in the south southwestern sky each night, I've been watching, of course, um, Mercury and Venus um, doing their little ballet. And right now, um, Mercury is coming down. Venus is going up. So on Wednesday evening, um, unfortunately, I think we're going to be clobbered with rain. Uh, which is good, but uh, it turns out Mars, I'm sorry, uh, Mercury and Venus are going to be 1.4 degrees apart. So if you find uh, Venus in the southwestern sky, you'll very easily get Mercury, very easily. Huh. So you guys just stay indoors. Now, what are we looking at here, Mr. President? We want this, to is, this is an artist's rendition of a meteor headed for Earth. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, the um, it's a little bit fanciful because um, it's burning up in the atmosphere, but you can see the atmosphere hasn't been reached yet in this picture. So mm -hmm. it may be a comet representation, but whatever it is, it's just something interesting approaching the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and what it is, is this um, meteor, which oh. Chuck explained to us. This is this is Fu Kang. This was found in China in the Gobi Desert. It was a big chunk, uh, and um, it's a ton. kind of meteorite called a palisite or a stony iron. <laughs> and these are meteorites that come from the interface between the core and the mantle of a differentiated body. One that melted and the heavy stuff went to the middle. <laughs> so you have lighter stuff like the yellow crystals there. You see that's olivine. That's a, a silicate mineral. And then you've got this nickel iron matrix that they're embedded in. So it's right on the mixing line between the molten nickel iron and the rock. The core yeah, this is matter. nickel iron here. Yeah. And these are very pretty because if you cut them in thin sections, you've got this sort of gem quality mineral uh, that, that looks like a stained glass window. Wow. And this particular one I have a I have a piece of. I don't know if it'll show very well because I'm showing up small here. And if I hold it next to the flag, it disappears. So if I hold <laughs> it in front of my face, it shows up. Um, yeah, and I got to adjust maybe how the light's hitting it. But there you can see how, um, yeah. Let's it looks real good. Camera. Looks real good. You've got the, uh, the mineral <laughs> crystals and you've got the uh, nickel iron matrix it's, Looks it's like your forehead pretty. is the perfect light source yeah <laughs> but it's, it's very pretty if you shine a light from behind it and this isn't showing oops this isn't <laughs> showing how golden the uh the the peridot is there the the olivine crystals mm -hmm. uh so they're they get made into jewelry or watch faces and things like that quite a bit wow and these are one of the rarer types of meteorites <laughs> You know what it looks like? Uh, one of those QR codes. If I hold my yeah. iPhone up to it, I'll be ordering something from Amazon. <laughs> now the key, the key point that Chuck made here is that this comes from inside a planetoid or a planet um, from the mantle, the bottom of the mantle, where it's near the core. So if something had to form, it's from our solar system because it's it uh, <coughs> was apparently orbiting our sun and so it, it's probably it's it is as old as our solar system and it indicates that our solar system was a largely a shooting gallery of things going around big things going around and colliding with each other because this came from a differentiated body which means something that was big enough that the heavy stuff sank to the center and the lighter stuff moved to the surface to form um, a surface, a mantle, and a core. So <clears throat> this is definitely from that interface on the mantle side. And uh, it's indicative of what the population was in our solar system at the very beginning. It's estimated to be about four and a half billion years old. So it's definitely old. So they collided that. with it and, and smashed it into pieces, and this is one piece. Yeah. But that big uh, 
that, that big uh, thing they found in the Gobi Desert of China is now over in uh, Tucson, isn't it? Yeah, you know, they sent pieces of it over there, I think a 20 kilogram piece. China, China let us take some of the Fukang with us? I think it's back in China now. It may be, uh, it was, when was it discovered in China, do you know? I think 1995, oh, okay. something like that. Huh. Well, now the piece we're looking at is it about the size of yours, or is that a giant piece we're looking that's, at? That's that's a big piece. That's probably the twenty kilogram piece. Oh, but the whole dang thing is uh, over a ton. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, well, it's quite big. There's a there's a typo in the write up because it says something like uh, smaller bits have sold for two hundred thirty two British pounds, thirty two dollars U.S. And that's that doesn't quite jive. It's no, probably I was struck. I was struck by the. the yeah. But we're not looking at sulfur in the yellow here. That's something else, right? No, this is the olivine crystals. Are, do do they, these things ever come with gold in them or silver or something? Sure, really? yeah. Okay. The one that I pass around has, has uh, gold in it and uh, uranium and all kinds of stuff, but just in very, very tiny quantities. Okay. Would it set off a Geiger counter lightly, uh, the, the uranium part? uh from yeah very lightly it's probably not as radioactive as the, as the rocks around santa barbara but mostly <laughs> mostly nickel i remember yes okay. well mostly iron and, and then nickel oh iron and wow we are not as radiation free as you might think if you had a geiger counter sitting on your desk right now assuming you don't have drywall from china in your house um <laughs> you're you're count would be about one count for five seconds and that would be due to cosmic rays but your bottom line on this sucker is that it's from a planet that doesn't exist anymore it's shattered that's or... right yeah planet it's this is one of the core pieces so it couldn't have been from mars because they found rocks in antarctica that came from mars at least they say they did yeah, yeah. but this doesn't match the surface stuff of mars no, this is from deep inside a differentiated body. And we don't know which one that is. Well, it's one that used to exist that no longer exists. Yeah. Well, there's only four rocky planets. Maybe from there were more. inside. Body. Run, there were in the more asteroid more belt. In the asteroid belt, there are lots of chunks of rocky stuff. And this was once one of the bigger chunks there, and it got beat to heck. Okay. Could have been a dwarf planet like Vista or whatever. Yeah. Got it. Well, you would love to have some, or you do have. Uh, it's part of your long-term collection. Yeah, this is a piece of it right here. <laughs> the invisible have, rock. Uh, Mr. President, do we have time to talk about the changing North Star, future pole star? In a shot. Yeah, we got five minutes. Why do poles change? Rotating pole stars, apparently it's due to us, our planet switching positions, yeah. wobbling or something on its axis. Yeah. Uh, changing. There it is. Uh, I found this article because um, I was looking up what was our pole star 5,000 years ago when the pyramids were built. Mm -hmm. Because someone, I saw an article where they said they lined it up with Polaris, the edge. Yeah. Our North Star, and I thought, what was our North Star then? And it was a star called Thuban, which turns out to be a very interesting star all by itself. Mm -hmm. But the Earth, the Earth is a spinning top, and it precesses um, slowly every twenty-three thousand. Twenty-six, twenty-six thousand. Yeah, twenty-six thousand five hundred years. Yeah, there it is, twenty-six thousand. Mm -hmm. Starting over here, and then. So this is sort of zero. This is the closest star to the pole here is Kochab uh, in uh, the, the- Little Dipper. A Little Dipper, yeah, the Little Bear. Um, Thuban, this was the pole star, pretty accurately aligned um, 5,000 years ago and will be again in 23,000 years from now. The next pole star in line is Irai. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll be about 4,000 AD. It's close here to Alderman, which I think was in Star Wars. But anyway, um, <laughs> comes close to Deneb, mm -hmm. close to Vega. Here it gets close to Tau Hercules. 
and then back to Thuban and Kolchev and Polaris again. Um, and the reason that it goes around like that is because the Earth wobbles on its axis. It's spinning around, and it has a, a displacement from its spin axis of 23 and a half degrees mm -hmm. uh, to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And by the way, that 23 degrees gives us uh, our seasons annually. The, uh, the uh, axis precesses, it goes around like a top, spinning top, uh, and makes a big circle in the sky right there every 26,000 years. Yeah. And Jerry, it's, it's a fun exercise if you see some of these stars on a dark night to take a look up at the North Star, which we can always see, and just get a sense of what this thing maps out in the night sky. It's really pretty. It's mm -hmm. huge. Well, it'll be 47 degrees right from left to right. You know, well, it's a, it's a big chunk. Isn't it slightly off of the exact spot in the sky where our extended axis is, a, what, a half yeah. a degree? Or? Yeah. Polaris is about a quarter of a degree off. Yes. Oh. So if we ever had a time in the future when, when there isn't a star within like five or six degrees, we're going to have a hell of a time, of, you know, navigating our way. Not well, as we have GPS, yeah, GPS now. GPS now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. You're right. But those yeah. stars, when they take over, Thuban and uh, what's the other, Ar Arai, are they going to be Arai. right uh -huh. on there? Mm -hmm. You're going to go right over the uh, axis. Well, they're not as go. close as Polaris is usually. Thuban is right on, but yeah. mm -hmm. Tower Vegas is as close. Yeah, they go be pretty far. And in the southern sky, they don't have quite this thing. I mean, the, the, the thing is wobbling. The Earth is wobbling, but they, they don't really have a Solaris, you know. <laughs> they don't have a South Star right yeah. exactly over the South. But Chuck, Chuck knows this area of the sky, and he, I, right, Chuck? And you mentioned. There's a star kind of close. Is There's a star true? kind of close. Um, oh boy, <laughs> I'm forgetting remember. the name. But yeah, th there's a star close there in a small constellation, but it's uh, it's not real bright. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you can kind of okay. use the main axis of the Southern Cross to point towards South. Okay. But speaking, oh, go ahead. Speaking of names, Polaris. It was named because it's the polar star. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, got recently, it. recently. Now here, this is Polaris today, 2000 AD. And here's Steuben 5,000 years ago. So this was right here was 2,500 years ago. And here was about 1,000 years ago. So the Vikings coming to North America did not have Polaris as a very close <laughs> star to the North Pole. Yeah. So they had to know a little bit more about star patterns in the North in order to do their celestial navigation at night. But they also had something called the sunstone, which yes. allowed them to locate the sun even on overcast days, as long as it was um, up or close to being up. It was a closely held secret. And we'll talk about that, a birefringent crystal. We'll talk about that at some future meeting. Yeah, it sort of related, Jerry, was, you know, when I was in high school, we had a, a hootenanny group I played banjo in. And we used to sing this song called Follow the Drinking Gourd. Oh, yeah. Gourd was was the dipper, the big dipper, and that's dipper. what the blacks used to look for to go north. They followed the yeah. drink board, yeah. On the Underground Railroad. Exactly, exactly. Escape slavery, yeah. I've been working oh. on the drinking gourd. You know that tune, Ron? Uh, no, but I've always, that's the only one I first got light of was the damn big dipper and uh, my but my grandfather used to point out the three sisters in Orion, and I knew that. I guess the whole uh -huh. world knows those. But gentlemen, we got yep. the hour behind us, and uh, doggone if we're not going to... We're still in the holidays, aren't we? Next yes. Happy New Year coming up. Yeah. yeah, well, look, we'll see you on Monday. We'll do it again a week from today. You can tell me what you got for Christmas and what your doctor is doing to treat it. <laughs> <laughs> tell your friend that reminds me of a joke. You know what you give, give a man who has everything? No, what? Can penicillin. Sweat. What is penicillin. it? Penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> I thought as, a kid, as a kid, I learned a can of sweat. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> penicillin is one of the two things I'm allergic to. Me too. Thank you.
Take care of your wives, your family, yeah. happy holidays.